Yeah, All right, folks, welcome back. Let's begin. So a quick note on a midterm project. So next week is going to be fall break. Um, and afterwards, it'll be maybe about one or two more weeks until the midterm project is due. So the instructions should be up on Piazza already. Uh, if not, they'll be up very soon. But the whole goal of the midterm project is to write a report evaluating state-of-the-art models on your chosen data set and task. Right, so evaluate the state of the art models. Our data set should be set up. The code for state of the art models should be set up. We should be able to run experiments. And ideally, the, the performance of the state of the art model and the errors that it has would inform your subsequent research ideas. So, several um, main things to consider. Uh, the report should be about eight to 10 pages, depending on how many people are on your team. And the goal is to benchmark a number of baseline state of the art models. So that's and team members, you should be benchmarking n minus one models. And most importantly, after you benchmark these models, you run on your data sets, um, you should come up with error analysis. Find out what exactly is the model failing at, and therefore coming up with new directions of work based on those errors. And just several possible ways of doing error analysis. I'm going to go through just a couple so they can get more inspiration on, um, on how you should go about doing this part of the midterm report. Uh, typically, well, when you run a model, the first thing you get is performance, right? You run a model, state of the art is 75%. But the whole goal of error analysis is to find out where that missing 25% is, right? What exactly contributes to the failure cases of the model? And there are several ways of decomposing this 25%. One is more data set based, um, split the correct, incorrect by your label, throughout the confusion matrix. Is it much more likely, for example, that a model fails in detecting negative samples? in those 25% then positive samples. So that's gonna give you some insight on where the model is failing. Another general way is to manually inspect um, the model's incorrect predictions. Perhaps you can rank the model by the ones that got the most incorrect. So not just incorrect, but very high confidence in getting it incorrect. See what samples those are. Um, ranking them kind of helps because you don't wanna go through all like, you know, 25% of 10,000 data points that were incorrect. So you can rank them um, see what the most incorrect data points were, see whether there were some commonalities and what are some main differences with the ones that a model mainly got correct. So again, that helps you get some insight, which again, you then use to formulate a research hypothesis on where the model is struggling. Another general way of doing things is to partition your data set into sub data sets. Let's say you hypothesize that certain uh, length of question is a factor that makes the model struggle, right? Another thing that you could hypothesizes that certain rare words, certain cluttered images, uh, certain signals that have lots of noise, lots of high frequency could contribute to the model struggling. So partition your data set according to that factor. So you can group it by short questions, medium length questions, very long questions, and plot the performance, right? So then you can see whether the performance is decreasing with the length of your question. And that's another way to gain insights on where your model is failing. So you wanna be seeing all this detailed type of analysis in the midterm report, right? Don't just report that the failure is 25%. We really wanna see all these cases of where it's failing. Several other ways, um, everything data set based still stay within a data set. Another general approach is perturbation based. Try to go beyond a data set, right? Try to give targeted changes to your input, to the question, to the image, to the audio and so on, and see whether the model fails. For example, you can change uh, just one specific word, change one part of the image, see whether the model is very sensitive to certain changes in the input. All right, so a lot of this goes into seeing whether the model remains robust to changes. For example, uh, I don't know if you all have seen some language models, um, they can answer a question correctly, but we put not in front of it, it will start answering a question incorrectly. Right? Or you can ask a question like, who is, uh, who is Justin Bieber's mom? You can answer that correctly. But if you start asking who is the son of Justin Bieber's mom, you start getting the answer incorrect. So very simple changes. People find that machine learning models are quite sensitive to. So perturbation-based methods are another way to uncover these errors. Another general way is uh, starting from the model. Instead of starting from the data, seeing which data points the model got correct or incorrect, look at what the model was doing internally when making predictions. And there's several general ways of doing this. For example, visualizing feature attributions, seeing uh, which particular parts of the input the model was focusing on when making some prediction. And that can be done 
using a series of methods based on first, second order gradients and so on. If you look at the whole field of interpretable or visualizing machine learning models, there's ways of looking at what the model is focusing on and whether that agrees with um, what you expect the model to look at. Different ambulation studies to see which parts of the model are important. Um, you might have seen some papers which really survey a field. Uh, for example, you know, contrastive learning, right? It's a very simple idea. Many people have written many, many, many papers changing a loss function, changing the way you select positive samples, negative samples, and contrastive learning. You have hundreds of these papers published, and then some person comes out afterwards and say, you actually benchmark all of these methods rigorously using the same amount of compute and hyperparameter tuning they all do similarly to the original contrastive learning method, right? You have a bunch of papers like this. Um, so ablation studies, careful ablation studies, actually seeing if the model components that were claimed to be required are actually required. And finally, some theory-based, if you're also inclined to do that. Um, sometimes you start with big deep learning models, multiple layers, multiple nonlinear activations. Can you just look at a simple case, right? Can I look out, write out the linear case or a simplest case and see whether the model is expected to perform well, even in the simplest case. Because if it doesn't work in the simple case, it's not gonna work in the complex case. So some good examples of that. Um, this is a nice paper I like very much. It's called On the Convergence of Atom and Beyond. All of you probably have used Atom before as an optimizer for your neural networks. What these folks showed is that if you just take a one-dimensional convex problem, which is perhaps the simplest type of problem you have, right? one-dimensional, convex, so you're guaranteed to be able to find the right solution. And you run Adam, and you see that Adam doesn't converge. Right? Even in the simplest case, Adam can't converge. And then it came up with some fixes for Adam so that it converges in the one-dimensional convex case, and subsequently, it also converges in the high-dimensional neural network case. It improves performance. So this example of good error analysis driven by simple methods. Another example is this. So this is more falling into the category of looking at what the model is picking up on when making predictions. So there's an example of an image captioning model. So the model takes in this image and it generates this caption, a man sitting at a desk with a laptop computer. And you see that it got the gender of the, the person wrong. Um, and what the people, what these folks found is that if you look at the feature activations of the model with respect to the pixels in the image, it wasn't actually looking at the person at all when generating this caption, all it was looking at was the computer. So it kind of inferred the correlation between um, the type of person and uh, the presence of the computer. And obviously that's not very good. They subsequently fixed it using a new kind of attention regularization method so that the model is actually looking at the right parts of the image when generating each word in the caption. The other thing is another example of, in my opinion, good error analysis, um, something you want to do in a midterm report and then aspiring the new method you develop for the final report. Okay, any quick questions about error analysis? Uh, we expect a good amount of detailed error analysis, not just reporting 75% accuracy, 25% inaccurate, but a really good amount of error analysis for the midterm report. Any questions? Great, we'll talk a little bit about uh, more error analysis in today's reasoning lecture and more in quantification lecture. But in general, the midterm report, the expectation is that you almost have um, a full research paper except the, the idea, the new idea, right? So you start with the abstract, intro data work, all of this should have been done for the, for the early reports. Um, the new parts are the problem statement, the baseline models, the experiments for the baseline models, and the error analysis for the baseline models. And ideally, that error analysis should inspire at least one final page on new possible research ideas you want to do for the final report. And several deadlines. Next week is fall break. And about two weeks after that, uh, your midterm report will be due. That's due Sunday, October 29th, 8 p.m. And the following week, Tuesday and Thursday, we're going to have midterm presentations. Um, so all the teams are going to come up, present for about 10, 10 ish minutes. Uh, all students are expected to be there, and all students are expected to present a little bit for about two or three minutes in the presentation. Okay? And the goal is to get feedback from the other students in the audience, get feedback from the TAs, the instructors on the midterm report. And the focus of these presentations is gonna be more about the research ideas. So you're not really expected to go that much in depth into the error analysis. That should be in the report. All the figures should be there in the report. The presentation is gonna be more about summarizing the errors and maybe discussing what possible ideas 
you're going to be working on. So we can also give feedback on those potential research ideas. Okay, any questions about uh, the midterm report? Aaron, not say. Yeah, Share modalities? Oh, error analysis. Um, it can be the same. It can be different. Most likely different set of the art models are going to show different errors. So you got to keep that in mind. Uh, but if it's if it's a trend that all state of the art models share sort the of same group of errors, that could also be an interesting finding. So speaking with that, um, your state of the art models should also not be too similar to each other. It should at least be sampled from different motivations at least. So it shouldn't be kind of the same motivation and there's three papers in the same motivation. Try to get some coverage. So most likely different people have written prior papers that each tackle a different part of the problem. Right? Some person may you know, try to use better language models for better reasoning. Some people try to use better uh, alignment methods and so on. So try to sample your state of the art model so that it covers different parts and then you can get a better idea of Okay, then back to the lecture. Um, so we're gonna continue our discussion on reasoning. This can be a last lecture on reasoning. Um, if you recall our roadmap so far is that you looked at two modalities with multiple elements in each modality. You just focus on one element in each. The goal is to learn some local representations, right? That was the first couple of weeks. You saw how to do fusion, coordination, and, and fission based on these local representations. Afterwards, we extended our discussion to have multiple elements in your modality, but multiple words in your sentence, multiple image regions in your image, each following some structure, some temporal or spatial structure. And then our goal was to learn the alignment between different elements in your modalities with the elements in other modalities. So you looked at um, discrete, continuous alignment, and how we can use transformers to learn the alignment. And finally, in the past, past couple of weeks, we've been looking at reasoning. So you have these individual representations learned and their alignments. How can we combine the information in a principal way that respects the structure of the problem. So we saw transformers gave us a way to do uh, temporal reasoning. Uh, other ways of doing included a hierarchical graphical reasoning. We could do that using graph neural networks. On Tuesday, we looked a little bit at reinforcement learning and how that gave us a way of learning interactive structure. So where the structure, the observations change over time. And the goal is to account for these changes over time to maximize some long-term reward. We started on Tuesday. Today, we're going to continue and wrap up the modeling of structure using structure discovery, where you don't know whether it's temporal structure or hierarchical structure or interactive structure. You don't know what the structure is. Can we discover the structure automatically from data? Can we, in some sense, optimize and learn the structure? Uh, the structure was the way they kind of compose elements. Uh, we also looked at how do we parameterize intermediate concepts. And typically, we always stay in continuous space continuous features or feature representations. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about discrete concepts, whether that be done using hard attention, gated attention, even language, words as an intermediate concept in your reasoning process. And finally, we're gonna talk about inference paradigm. How do you combine information? How do you combine information from two local elements to get some higher order reasoning information? We're gonna discuss ways to do that using um, causal and logical formulations. And finally, towards the end of the lecture, we're gonna cover a little bit about common sense. What other external common sense data, common sense knowledge graphs can be used to inform you of your reasoning process. All right, so structure discovery. Extending temporal hierarchical interactive structure to a case where your structure has to be discovered. So you might recall this slide from uh, LP's lecture Last week, we um, started talking about transformers, and then we saw how transformers can be extended to have some structure, and we discussed neural module networks, right? If you recall, in this case, there was a question. Um, and what this question, first given a question, you will then parse the question. You parse the question and break it down to individual steps. For example, if you want to answer, is there a red shape above a circle? You might first attend to the red, sh red shapes. You might then attend to the circles. You might attend to what are above the circles. And then you will combine both using the AND operator and see whether any attention maps were still activated after that. And if there were, then you will say there is a red shape and above a circle. So this whole structure is in some sense a tree, a hierarchical tree. 
right? And how the structure of the tree was obtained was through parsing the question. So in some sense, you require a perfect parser uh, so that you can get the exact tree structure obtained from the parser, and then you could execute these neural module networks, right? And every step was basically a local fusion that slowly combined to getting the answer. And of course, the natural extension is whether the structure can be learned end to end. What if you don't have a perfect parser? Let's say your questions are rare or you see a sentence structure that is different during testing from something that you see during training. How do you actually generalize to these new types of questions in the case of having an imperfect parser? So ideally in deep learning, we wanna do things end to end, right? We wanna be able to train the process of going from the question and image to the structure of the problem and then end to end go from the structure of the problem to getting the right answer. So ideally you wanna solve this. You wanna be able to give an image and the question, find the right combination of modules in the right tree-based structure so that you can then give it to a neural model network on top of that learned structure and then give the answer, right? So this part is new. The part of automatically inferring what the structure of the neural model network should be given the input. So this, as you might see, is hard, right? This is a little bit different from your traditional classification, regression, even generative problems, because you need to choose modules, and these modules are discrete. So whatever module you choose, uh, it's gonna affect what you choose in the other modules. These modules are discrete, and it's also a sequence to which how you choose these modules. And if you remember from last Tuesday's lecture, that actually is very similar to reinforcement learning, because in reinforcement learning, you have a similar problem we have to choose some actions that may be discrete in nature. And after you choose these actions, you might then change what actions you might be choosing at your next steps and next steps. In this case, this can be seen as a reinforcement learning problem of five steps, right? You choose one of these, um, you choose one of these, these individual parts and you start choosing the other parts based on the previous things that you've chosen. So you can think of the selection of these modules as a policy, pi the same policy that we saw in reinforcement learning that takes in a state S, where S is your original input image and the question, and perhaps other modules you might have chosen previously. And A is your action, that's a selection over all the modules you have. And pi is essentially your distribution telling you from the states, so the current input image and the question and what modules you might have chosen previously, what module should I choose next? Right? What's the distribution of modules I should choose next? And then your entire sequence of modules in the right sequence would then be seen as your trajectory. Right? You're gonna first sample the first module, A0. Uh, given the first module that you've chosen, you're gonna choose the next one to put up after that, and you're gonna put the next one after that, and after that, and so on, until you slowly build up the tree structure. And once you have this selection of modules in this tree structure, that's your trajectory, you can pass it to your neural module network. That's gonna give you some accuracy. Right, it's gonna run the neural module network on that selection of modules on that trajectory. It's gonna give you some accuracy and we're gonna use that accuracy as a reward. Right, that's gonna tell you the reward of that trajectory, essentially estimating the reward of that selection of modules in that particular tree structure, your model as output. So you can actually view this as a reinforcement learning problem. In fact, it's a very general formulation of these types of problems that is called stochastic optimization. Or some people have heard it as discrete optimization. Uh, but essentially these type of problems fall into this general formulation where there's some parameters that you wanna learn, parameters data. Usually these parameters data are parameters in your policy network that output your, your um, in this case, your modules or your actions. Given these, policy, these parameters data, you're gonna define a policy these policies usually have some um, distribution Q with respect to theta that can be seen as your policy network. And Z is essentially the thing you're trying to output. In this case, either a sequence of actions or a sequence of modules. And for the Zs, there's gonna be some reward assigning certain sequences of Zs that are better and certain sequences of Zs, your actions to be worse. Right? In reinforcement learning, we saw that as, um, as again, this general problem, we're trying to maximize some parameters data with respect to your long-term cumulative reward. And your theta essentially prescribes a policy that tells you which action sequences are more likely and which are less likely. So that's the expectation of trajectories under your distribution of trajectories. 
And finally, each trajectory has a reward. Certain trajectories will have higher reward based on cumulative long-term reward. Certain trajectories will have lower reward. So these are actually the same problem, right? The same problem of learning to maximize a set of parameters that tells you a distribution over actions, how likely they are, and where each set of actions has some reward, either better or worse. And we saw that reinforce is a general purpose solution. Reinforce estimator is a very general solution. They essentially say that if you wanna solve these class of problems, just take a gradient. Take a gradient with respect to theta and optimize that gradient. Right? You wanna maximize something, just take a gradient and do gradient ascent on it. And we saw that there was this nice term of taking these gradients where you wanna take a gradient with respect to theta. You can bring the gradient in, but what changes is that now you have the reward times the gradient of the log probabilities of the actions taken under those parameters, right? And we saw that this had a really nice interpretation because for trajectories, Z with good reward, I'm going to increase the log likelihood of the actions within that trajectory. For these trajectories, F of Z with low reward, so F of Z is really negative, then I'm going to decrease the log probabilities of the trajectory, the actions within that trajectory. And the good thing that you can really just sample this, basically you can replace the expectation with a bunch of samples. You can sample a bunch of trajectories. The ones that are good, increase the actions within that trajectory. And if their trajectory gave you something bad, I'm gonna decrease the probabilities of those actions. All right, so that's what we derived last, um, last Tuesday, right? The policy gradient equation. And it's a very general purpose formulation. So Z, what your actions are, essentially Z, your trajectories can be discrete or continuous. Q of Z can be any distribution, whatever your policy is. The only thing is that your Q of Z must allow differentiability with respect to theta, right? Your policy outputs must be differentiable with your policy parameters. And finally, your F, which is your, your function telling you how good something is, how good the sequence of actions is, or how bad it is, can be any black box. It doesn't have to be differentiable. Yes? Uh, Z is a trajectory. FZ is how good a trajectory is, the reward of the trajectory. So what it is applied here is that you have the image and the question. You're going to learn this policy. So this policy has parameters pi that takes in these states and outputs some actions. The actions are essentially a selection of these modules. So once you've chosen a bunch of these modules and you assemble them in the right way, that's going to be trajectory tau. That's your sequence of actions. You can then put these sequence of actions into your neural module network. That's going to execute the inference of the answer based on this structure. And it's going to recur some reward, whether you got it correct or incorrect. And finally, this reward function can be then used to update your policy parameters theta using the same policy gradient equation. Essentially saying that if I assemble these modules in a certain way that gave high reward, high reward R, after running a new module network, I'm gonna increase the probabilities of those actions. If I assemble the modules in a way that gave low reward after running through a new module network, so R is low. Yes, good question. Um, so in this case, you might need to alternate, right? You need to alternate between uh, training a module networks and you kind of updating updating the uh, structure. But good, well, well, these folks were from the same group. So they did module networks first. They kind of trained it on structures that were output by a parser, so where the structure was fixed, and they had a kind of pre-trained module networks based on those fixed structures. And this is a follow-up work where they further kind of tried to learn the structure end-to-end -to -end together with the new module networks. Yeah, I mean, same question as the other students. So um, the new network model is probably pre-trained on fixed structures obtained by a parser. But as you train the structure learning, uh, you probably want to iteratively update both, right? You're gonna change the structure learning. And after some time, the, the structure that a neural module network sees is gonna be different from the ones that was originally trained on. And then you might wanna retrain a neural module network on these new structures. And you start learning new structures, train the net networks again and so on. Okay, great question. So, so yes, it's a general formulation. Whenever you see things that require you to output some set of discrete modules, uh, and afterwards, these discrete modules get input to some black box reward function. The black box reward function is not differentiable, right? It's like a separate neural module network. It's not differentiable all the way end to end. 
policy gradient is a general way of doing this, where you're essentially saying, I'm going to sample, sample all these actions, see which ones are good with respect to reward, increase the log probabilities, see which ones are bad with respect to reward, and decrease those log probabilities. So reinforces a general solution. And you can extend this, right? Uh, There's a whole field of looking at architecture search uh, where you know, we start talking about fusion and we start talking about um, how do you do concatenation fusion, like early fusion, how do you do attention fusion or gated attention, different ways of building up these fusions. And a lot of that was kind of human knowledge telling you what type of fusion to choose, right? In general, you can also learn these fusion methods uh, directly from data essentially just searching over what fusion method is best, right? Should I do convolution, unimodal convolution first and self-attention first before putting into concatenation, before doing attention and so on? You can automatically search for the right combination of these modules in order to assemble a final fusion method. And three general steps of doing this, right? First, you might wanna define some basic unimodal building blocks, ReLU, layer norm, convolution, self-attention, you want to define some basic fusion building blocks like concatenation, attention, gated, dynamic gating, and so on. And once you have these modules here, you can then automatically search for the right structure of these modules using architecture search. And the idea of architecture search is the same, right? Treat it as learning a policy that takes in your states, which is usually parameterized as the input multimodal data and perhaps what modules you've already selected. And then it's going to output a distribution over the next modules to choose, right? And that has some policy parameters data. To train these, I'm going to first sample these trajectories from theta. So first sample how you're going to build up this structure. The trajectory then defines the entire fusion network, your, your model. Uh, that can then be trained on your training data, evaluated on your validation data to get some measure of performance, maybe 50%. That's going to be seen as a reward. And using the reward, update the policy parameters data using a policy gradient equation. Right. Essentially saying, uh, if I selected a sequence of actions to build up this multimodal model that had good validation performance after training, I'm going to increase the actions that I took in that trajectory. And vice versa, if the multimodal model that I assembled was bad and gave low validation performance, I'm going to decrease the log probabilities of those. And this is nice. It is, um, in some sense, you don't need to use any knowledge. You don't need to think at all. You just need to throw all your data and throw this code at it. But of course, the drawback is that it's very slow, right? Instead of assembling a model and training it once, validating it once, testing it once, you're essentially uh, training multiple models every time, validating it. Training a model's But there's some cool extensions. Um, Essentially, everything here you see in discrete space, the modules within your structure uh, was always kind of discrete, and you kind of selected one of them. You can also kind of go into continuous space um, and do a soft selection over these modules. So one thing you can do is instead of selecting one module, uh, select learn an attention distribution, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Uh, there are non, there are greater than zero and some to one there are soft weights over all three of them. So essentially telling me after I've done this conv and layer norm, you know, maybe 0.2 probability I should do concatenation fusion, 0.6 probability I should do addition fusion, you know, point, um, 0.2 probability I should do attention fusion, and so on. So now you're approximating your selection with a softmax. So you're always taking all these output heads that you might have, and you're learning a softmax distribution with attention weights alpha over them. And then you can formulate your problem using a more continuous solver instead of using a discrete reinforced solver. We're essentially saying that I'm trying to learn the distribution of these weights alpha. The distribution of weights essentially tells you which parts of the model to choose, right? What is the structure? Uh, you're going to learn alpha. And for every alpha, I'm going to have to train the model to completion. Right? I'm going to have to train for that particular setting of alpha. That defines one particular multimodal model, right? I'm going to have to train that on a training data test it on the validation data, get some measure of performance. So that's what this line is doing. And then I can use that validation performance uh, in, the fine, in the outer loop of the objective to then take a gradient step with respect to alpha. Right? And the next time I get another alpha, that's gonna define a different 
setting up a multimodal model, a different structure. I'm going to train that to completion, obtain a validation performance, and I use that to take a gradient step with respect to alpha. Right. And finally, you've done that during training. So training, you start with these soft edges. And finally, if you want to use a model, you're just going to convert the soft max to your max. So it's faster, but it's still non-trivial because you have this inner loop that trains the model to completion multiple times uh, before you can kind of optimize the outer loop. So it's still going to be quite slow. And finally, one last thing I want to mention um, is also in the, on the lines of continuous discovery of structure. It's a very nice paper. There's not in multimodal space, but I think there's a lot of extensions and maybe applications to multimodal. So essentially, this idea of learning structure uh, is a very general problem that we see a lot in graphical models, right? If some of you have heard or taken class on probabilistic graphical models, you have these DAGs, basically, right? Each of these are random variables. And these arrows basically indicate some conditional independence in your graphical model. Uh, in a lot of cases, these structures are given. Uh, but it's also a huge field of research where you don't know what's a structure, and you try to learn it in these probabilistic graphical models. And it used to be that learning a structure is combinatorial. It's NP-hard, uh, essentially because you have to learn some objective such that, uh, so in this case, the graph is G. My data is X and W is adjacency matrix. So this is a way of parameterizing these graphs, right? It's basically a matrix of nodes by nodes where I, J is one, and there's an edge between node I and node J. So it's gonna be a big sparse graph. Uh, so essentially you have all these classes of problems that try to define some objective function, in this case L, over these graphs with respect to your data. And you gotta make sure that you wanna learn your structure of a graph W, such that W falls into these class of directed acyclic graphs. So directed acyclic graphs are essentially directed graphs that don't have a cycle between them. And most of the times when we talk about structure learning, like your tree structure or hierarchical structure, everything that we've seen in the previous couple of slides, all of it was essentially searching over directed acyclic graphs. You can have a loop because then you just start looping inside your model and you don't go to the output. So it can be seen as, again, learning over DAX, like trying to search for the best possible DAC in all of your DAX over those number of nodes that has the best objective. And this recent paper showed that although the original problem formulation was combinatorial, there's a way of defining a new function H of W, where this H of W takes in an adjacency matrix and essentially tells you whether it is or is not a DAC. Right? So you can essentially rewrite the constraint as this. Right, H of W equals to zero essentially means that it is a DAC. And then you can then minimize your objective. Uh, if your objective is differentiable, you can just minimize it. And this, co this condition is also differentiable. So you can also minimize it with respect to that differentiable constraint. So what is that magical function H? Uh, just very quickly, this magical function H is essentially this power of this matrix by right, taking this matrix power and we take this matrix power because it's a very cool property that if you take an adjacency matrix of a graph and raise it to the kth power, then what the diagonals on that matrix will tell you is the number of k step halves from one node to the other. Uh, it's a property in graph theory. Uh, you can prove it or you can look at a proof online. Essentially, the kth power raising this matrix to the kth power, what a diagonal will say is essentially whether there's um, a k step cycle from one node to the other. And that basically means that the diagonal of this matrix power is all zeros. There are no k-step cycles. And that's a cool property. So basically you can take the trace, which computes the diagonal of the exponential of this matrix. And the exponential will be written as I, which is just the matrix by itself. So whether there's any one-step cycles um, to the power of two, whether there's any two-step cycles, three where there's any three step cycles, four where there's any four step cycles and so on. And all you gotta do is just check until from one to K, uh, one to the size of the graph, sorry. So now you basically have a differentiable function that basically is zero only if your thing is a DAC, if your graph was a DAC. And this is also a very nice gradient uh, that you can solve. So they use this for, for learning DAX and graphical models. No reason why it can't be used for learning 
um, DAX or multimodal structure. Essentially, instead of doing architecture search, all you got to do is define your objective, compute this equation, which is a very nice gradient, and then optimize your objective subject to this. This is a cool extension. Um, but yes, we saw structure discovery. We saw cases where you don't know the structure. Uh, we saw ways of learning the structure from a discrete point of view, where you kind of combine the structure one step at a time, where every step is a discrete selection, and how you can solve that using reinforce methods, because you can view that as a reinforcement learning problem of selecting different actions in a multi-step sequence. And then we also saw some extensions in a continuous case where you could do um, either a softmax thing or this, this uh, structure discovery thing using, using your adjacency matrix of your graph. Yeah, so um, so they basically did it for structure discovery. So usually in graphical models, you might have like a couple of random variables. For example, like the, the weather is like a random variable. Um, the weather, whether the weather, like whether the, the grass is wet, whether you take an umbrella, the number of people that show up to class, um, and so on, right? You have all these random variables, and sometimes you know the structure between them. You know that, for example, weather causes less people to show up to class, and weather causes the grass to be wet, and so on. Um, so that's kind of a case where you know the structure. Of course, there are other cases where you don't know the structure. You just have the random variables, but you don't know how they are linked with each other. Right. So general problem of learning, uh, which thing causes which. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so essentially, you have all these random variables, but you don't know how they should be placed together. And essentially, what this does is that essentially searching over uh, different graphs, different ways of of putting these things. Um, that's a good question. It can be anything. If, if you find that um, something like that would be helpful, then yes, you could probably define a reward function on that. Essentially, a good thing about these RL type of methods is that. Um, once you've defined your policy and output your sequence of actions, it can be any black box reward function. Uh, in in reinforcement learning, it's a black box function where it's like the environment, a simulator, right? That outputs a reward. Over here, it just so happens that it's gonna be like a separate neural multi-network pipeline that you're training that outputs a reward. And that's why we say this is a general solution because normally if you try to do this using like, like normal gradient-based methods, you will not be able to back propagate through the black box environment, right? You'll not be able to go back here. Um, so essentially here is just saying, I'm gonna take a bunch of samples. I'm gonna put it into the black box function, see what rewards it gives me and use that to, to update um, the samples that I started taking. The next dimension was concepts, right? We've seen uh, lots of cases of using differentiable concepts um, in your layers, basically any neural network, any transformer uses intermediate concepts that are just representations. There are also general ways of using hard attention um, as discrete concepts. Hard attention can be preferable because now you can at least better interpret what these concepts are because there is just like a very clear uh, thing that the model is choosing. But hard attention is also hard because they're discrete, uh, but the same idea applies. You can essentially learn these given multimodal inputs, learn a controller that tells you your policy, uh, that samples actions, and these actions are essentially hard attention scores. It can be zero, one hard attention scores. If you have a sentence, for example, with many words, the policy will essentially output zero, one for each word, whether each word is or is not useful to the output, or if each image region is or is not useful to the output. And once you have these controllers, that defines a subset of data that you're then giving to the model. You can train that model, get the accuracy on validation data, reward, and update the controller again using policy gradient equation. So anywhere you see hard attention, it's a bit more complex to, to solve than soft attention. Your soft attention is just directly differentiable. But good thing about hard attention is that you can then get um, very clear, very clear concepts, right? If you want to do this in the case sentiment, emotional analysis, 
if the person is not expressive in gestures, just don't take the input. Captioning. If you have soft attention in image captioning, uh, you do get some form of attention, but it's still a bit blurry whenever you generate a word. If you get hard attention, then you're just zooming into like a patch in the image that is much more interpretable as a concept for humans to interpret, to analyze. Okay. Hard attention, yeah, it's a relatively you no know, basic extension from soft attention, but if you read the papers, you're gonna mention reinforce as a way of learning these hard attentions. We reinforce again this this uh, kind of discrete estimator that allows you to learn these hard attention and discrete concepts. Okay, finally, uh, the three concepts via language. Uh, language is great because if you have language at every step of reasoning. What you can basically do is you can interpret and look at every step exactly, right? You can understand what the model was understanding in the concepts and how they were combining these concepts. And nowadays, of course, we know that with language models, we can do something like this, where if you want to build a big multimodal model, what you can do is you can take a language only model that takes in language and outputs language, a vision language model that takes in some visual information and outputs a language description of that, and likewise, audio language model that takes in audio information and outputs, language descriptions of that. And then you can start chaining these things up where language is an intermediate medium in which you're sharing information between them. So you're gonna start by prompting a model saying that I'm an intelligent bot, this image is what, I think there's this number of people, and all of these green things are essentially output by the vision language model. Right, the vision language model is gonna look at the image and look at these prompts, and then it's gonna output number of people, type of elephant and so on. And then a language model chains everything up. Okay, so this is the important part, right? This this is a kind of a template where language is the medium. Um, this is output by the language model, and each of these green things is going to be something that the vision language model outputs because the green things are the ones that the vision language model has to look at the image and output the number of people, the places, the objects, and so on. And all that can be done by just prompting the vision language model. And once you fill in each of these things, um, so image type, number of people, different places, different objects, then you can get a language model to actually summarize the caption. Like right? taking all that kind of ugly templated text, but rewriting it in a nicer caption. So that's done by the language model. Okay, you can also do this for some other tasks, in this case, robotics. So right here, there is some robot arm. Uh, and you're trying to control that robot arm in order to rearrange these objects on the table. So the input from the user is move all the blocks to the different corners counterclockwise. And the language model is gonna take that and generate a sequence of individual steps. So pick up each block, put it there, pick up each block, put it there. And that gives the vision language model, which will then actually and finally, you can extend it to videos as well. So videos, uh, your video, you can cut it up into multiple frames, get the vision language model to process each individual frame and output again the places, the objects, the activities. That's gonna be then just given like this frame is this location, this frame is this activity, this frame is this activity and so on. You can give all of this to a language model and treat that as basically the history of everything that you've seen in the video frame the places, the activities, and this two hours later, the frame, the places, the activities, an hour later, places, activities, all of this will get concatenated into this whole history. That can then be given to a language model to process, and you can start asking, um, right, so where to leave my mug? And you can go back to history and find the place where you left your mug. Did I drive today? No, I did not drive because the places you are at home all day and you go to the front porch just to receive a package and so on. All right. Any other questions about discrete concepts by language? Um, nowadays, you can do this with language models, but again, there's several open questions. Right? How do you actually um, do this hierarchically in combining kind of using discrete concepts in language or anything we've looked at in terms of structure before that? Because this is still. It's nice using language as an intermediate medium, but it's almost just like one step, where you convert everything to language, and based on language, I'm gonna do QA. Uh, it's not, doesn't respect multiple step structure. You can't really combine it with. All 
right, inference paradigm. Inference paradigm studies how we can take individual representations and learn features of higher order. And again, a lot of the ideas in representation fusion can be useful here because the whole representation fusion was to kind of build up more informative features from individual features. Uh, but these are not that interpretable. It may not be that robust. And that's why in a lot of reasoning, people care about using, for example, logical operators. If you know that logical operators are gonna be part of the question. And afterwards, we're gonna look a little bit at causal inference. So logical inference based case studies, if I have some logical problem, uh, how can I take the premises, which are the individual parts, infer from multimodal evidence, evidence, and derive more logical conclusions on top of these premises? So here's a nice example. In fact, this is a very nice example for error analysis as well. Right? If I have these images and I start asking questions, is there beer? Is a man wearing shoes? Uh, these are easy questions. right? These are questions that a model gets correct most of the time, basic premises. And then if I just start asking, is the man not wearing shoes and is there beer? Uh, that requires some logical connectives. And these folks found that these models kind of struggle with it. And then you can ask uh, even some adversarial things. Right? Is there beer and is there a wine glass? So you never really see a wine glass at all in the image. Any object detector, uh, object detector would not pick up wine glass, but you can still ask it. And of course, there should be no wine glass, right? But the models are going to start being sensitive to some of these spurious correlations. So existing models pretty much struggle with these logical connectives and also these adversarial premises. How can we make them more logical? So this is again, good example of error analysis, right? You started with some existing data set of basic premises. That's what typical VQA data sets test for. And you can start perturbing them, uh, asking them the more targeted questions and systematically uncovering that logical connectives and adversarial premises could be an issue. And then you can create a new data set, you can build new models for tackling these issues. So of course, if you know that there's gonna be logical connectives, you can design a model that respects this information. So if I ask you, are they in a restaurant and they, are they all boys? You can separately train models or run pre-trained models on are they in a restaurant and are they all boys? Typically these models will get it correct because these are just basic premises, simple VQA questions. And once you have that information, you can then kind of manually define a logical and operator on top of these outputs in order to combine it to get a, are they in a restaurant and are they all boys? And also that applies to other logical connectives. And it's a pretty simple idea to integrate logical reasoning into your multimodal models. Of course, if you just do and in like PyTorch, this wouldn't work. It's not differentiable. Uh, and there's cool ways of kind of defining relaxations of and or operators with lower bounds and upper bounds that are more differentiable. And these are called the Fretcher inequalities. Um, some, I'll show this simple intuition for union, for example. It's essentially looking at if you have two events, A or B, A or B happening, I'm gonna look at the worst case and the best case, right? The worst case is that they're completely separate. So the upper bound is just their summation of the events, their probabilities. And the best case is when A and B are exactly contained with each other, in which case the OR of them is just the, uh, the larger one, the max of P of A and P of B. So you can prove that P of A or B is always going to be upper bounded by A plus B, and it's going to be lower bounded by the maximum of P of A and P of B. Right? Can improve pretty easily. And then you can take these upper bounds and lower bounds, which are now differentiable because they're essentially functions of your probabilities with some min or max functions. That's just to threshold it between zero and one. And you can put it back into this, right? The left branch is going to output a probability of whether they're in a restaurant, the right branch is going to output a probability of whether they're all boys. You can combine it using and and or to get upper bounds and lower bounds for the probabilities of A and B and A or B. Right? And then these upper and lower bounds are differentiable. You can train them using. And yeah, so a lot of extensions, a lot, a lot of open directions, logical inference. This is also related with this whole idea of uh, reasoning over knowledge bases, especially in a differentiable way and making a way combat compatible with deep learning language models. Essentially, there's a lot of ways um, people have studied making these language models more robust. Right? We know language models hallucinate. They don't have knowledge of what is logical, factual, truthful, or not. But a separate study of knowledge bases, knowledge graphs, like Wikipedia knowledge graphs, is a way of making them more truthful. But how do you bring them together? 
Uh, still a big open question. There's some references here. Uh, but essentially, you kind of got to augment these language models with the ability to retrieve from these knowledge graphs. Right? If you have an input prompt, uh, for example, that says, in which country Y does X have an office? Um, you got to be able to kind of retrieve from these knowledge bases that New York, Uber has an office in New York. New York is a country in USA. Lyft has an office in Paris. Paris is a city in France and so on. So you can eventually chain these things up to get the right answer, right? You have to first chain up office in a city and then a city in a country to get office in a country and I'll put that right answer. So all of these combination of logical connectives, there has some, some initial work on building retrieval augmented language models, but definitely a big area. Okay, last two things. Um, I'm going to talk about causal inference a little bit. How can we integrate causal knowledge into multimodal models? So some of you I might have seen causal, right? Causal inference is super dependent on the idea of interventions. you got to intervene in your data. You can't just stick with what has already been seen in your data, X and Y, because all you see in X and Y might be associations, right? Causations, uh, association describes what the observed patterns are in your data. Causation actually describes how things would have changed if there were different circumstances. And so let me give some very simple examples to illustrate this. Let's say you're writing a plot where you first generate x from random variables, and you're going to infer y from x, right? So y is a function of x. You're going to see this plot over here where x is on the x-axis, y is on the y-axis. Another way of generating the same plot is you generate y first randomly, and then you write x as a function of y. You sample them enough, you're going to get the same plots in expectation. Another way is to uh, sample z from some random numbers, infer x from z and infer y from z. Right now, you get x and y; they're the same function, so you can again obtain x and y that looks the same. And of course, these look the same on picture, but let's just say I really want to set x equal to three. I want uh, on x-axis x to always be equal to three. So what's going to happen in the first picture is I'm going to generate x randomly. I'm going to ignore that random number. I'm going to set it to 3. And then when I infer y from x, y is going to change when I set x equal to 3. right? In a second picture, I had generated y first from some random variable. And I inferred x from y. So if I set x equal to 3, y has already been set. right? So y is not going to change. And finally, in the third picture, I create a z. And I create an x from z and y from z. Um, y has already been created from z. So if I set x equal to 3 separately, it will change x, but it will not change y. Right? So now I get 3 plus like this. x is always equal to 3 on the x-axis, but a distribution of y, as shown in the y-axis, can be widely different. And I guess all of you might have seen a glimpse of this before, but you can probably understand my point, which is that intervention is a different from what you observe in your data. Right. What you observe in your data is basically a marginal distribution of y when x happens to be 3 in your data. All of that is the same for all three of them. The intervention distribution is setting x equal to 3 manually. We write that as a do x equal to 3. And what does the distribution of y look like when I manually set x equal to 3? And you saw that it can be quite different. Right. It can be the case where setting x equal to 3 is going to influence the value of y subsequently. And also when setting x equal to 3, doesn't influence the value of y. And in graphical model terms, again, the first one is when you generate x and x causes y. Or x has an arrow to y. The second case is when you generate y first, y has an arrow back to x because x is inferred to y. And the third one, unsurprisingly, is when you generate z as a random variable, and that causes what you see in x and y. And when you do this do calculus to actually measure the causal effect, when you apply your do, of setting x to a particular value in the first one, you're still seeing the exact same graphical model because x causes y, so I set x to some value, it is again going to change the value of y. In a second case where y causes x, if I set x to be some particular value, then y and x are going to be disconnected. And whatever value that you set to x is not going to change y because y has already been set previously. And finally for z, if I set z and z causes x and y, if I do some intervention on x, x will be separate, it's not going to change z, and it's not going to change y. Right? Those have already been set, but z still causes y. Right? So all of these three cases 
we saw the same data on surface, but you're not gonna be able to infer which of these three cases it is without actually intervening. Or well, that's what we saw here, right? Um, the, on, on, on the surface, these three things look the same, but only when you intervene can you distinguish one. Prevention typically is very hard. Uh, when you wanna ask a question like, does treatment X help treat disease Y? All these questions they ask in medical, you never really get an answer because you can never really estimate the intervention P of Y given do X. Essentially what that would mean is that for the exact same patient who had maybe taken the drug today, you see what the outcome is tomorrow. And can you then go back in time and for the exact same patient in the previous day, like don't take the drug and see what is the outcome in the next day. So you're typically never gonna be able to do this intervention in real life, um, which makes it quite hard to do causal. And typically there's some terms, X is typically the one that causes Y, X is the treatment variable, Y is the outcome, and Z is typically the confounding variable if it causes both X and Y. And so Z is actually one that causes instead of X and Y causing each other. But a multimodal, again, some good examples of error analysis, right? You have these models that you think work pretty well. I ask you how many zebras are in the picture. Uh, the answer is two, and that's okay. There's one zebra here, there's one zebra in the background. So ideally you would think that the causal graph is something like this, right? Zebras is a treatment variable. That is the important variable which should cause the model to make the prediction to. So on the surface, all you see is one example of two zebras and having a prediction too. You might never really know whether it's actually a causal effect that a model is capturing or it's some spurious correlation. For example, when you ask about zebras with a plural, you typically always only ask it when there's two zebras, right? You never ask zebras for one and you never really see three zebras that often. So two could be kind of a spurious correlation. How do you actually check that? Uh, well, I'm gonna change the treatment variable by making an intervention, I'm gonna use Photoshop and remove one of the zebras, right? It's a bit manual. You can't do it with that much of scale, but this is kind of the proper way you should be testing whether the models are robust to, to actually the treatment variable. So I'm gonna change it, I'm gonna intervene, remove one of the zebras. Oh, the model still gives two. The model still answers two instead of answering one, which is the right answer. So that's an example of a conditional uh, intervention uh, based on setting zebras to be one manually, keeping the rest of the image, keeping the rest of the question constant, and you realize that these models uh, struggle when it faces some of these spurious correlations. Another example, what color is the balloon? Over here you see that there are some balloons in the background that are red in color, but there's also some umbrellas in the background that are pink in color. So in this case, umbrellas and balloons might look pretty similar, right? Ideally, you want the model to use balloon and only look at the balloon, nothing else, and make the prediction. But in this case, you could see why the umbrella could be a confounding factor that influences the presence of balloons and also what your prediction is. So in this case, the baseline actually got this wrong. It output pink instead of red. Uh, is my model picking up on irrelevant objects and therefore giving the wrong answer? So what I can do is I can make a targeted intervention on the irrelevant object on the umbrella uh, by removing the umbrellas. Okay. Removing those umbrellas using Photoshop. And now finally the model outputs red. Right. So by removing the irrelevant object, the model has then learned to focus on the, the right object, give the right answer. That means previously it was focusing on the irrelevant object. Right. It's just looking at things that seem colorful and maybe picking them up. So that's again an a, a intervention on the confounding variable by setting manually no umbrella. Okay, so again, some good errors, examples of error analysis to uncover some of these shortcomings. And of course, if you do this, how can you then improve your model? So it's a very simple extension to data augmentation, where you spend all your effort getting uh, these targeted data augmentations that reveal something about the causal nature of the problem then give the model this data, right? In the case of zebras, uh, with the two zebras, the answer should be two. With one zebra removed, the answer should be one. You know, make sure that um, 
This is an example where the model's answer should change, right? Because you've targeted the object of question, you've changed that number, it should change answer from two to one, right? So make sure you regularize your model, you know, train whatever with these two examples, train it to make sure that the answer changes. In this case, the second case where you're asking what color is the balloon, and there's this irrelevant umbrella in the image, by targeting the irre irrelevant object, the answer should not change, right? So make sure to impose some invariance, making sure the answer does not change with and without the irrelevant object. All right? Okay, and of course, causal is not easy, right? You typically never really get these things for free. Uh, so you gotta use some domain knowledge about what might be the actual treatment variable, the one that causes the prediction, you might need to use domain knowledge to get what is the actual or possible confounding variables that might confound the treatment and the outcome. All right, any questions about? So if you alluded to in the talk so far, um, a lot of these things require some domain knowledge, right? For example, domain knowledge to tell you what are the, what's the causal graph, domain knowledge to tell you what are the logical operators, but generally you need lots of domain knowledge to tell you the structure, the way to parameterize your concepts, the way to combine your concepts through inference. And there's several ways of obtaining domain knowledge, uh, knowledge graphs, graphs, knowledge, and other unstructured formats. Knowledge graphs look like this, right? So if I ask you what kind of board is this, you see a person doing water sports, you ask what kind of board is it. This typically requires some knowledge of water sports, sports equipment, and so on, right? So if you just train a supervised model on the training data, and you don't see many other examples of water sports, your model is not going to be able to answer this question accurately. So of course, you can go to Wikipedia, right? You can start by detecting the objects, the scenery, the background in the image. You realize that it is typically in water, uh, surfing related, and so on. You can go to Wikipedia. You can do some form of retrieval from Wikipedia by looking at similar Wikipedia web pages. By parsing it, you can obtain some concepts. In this case, in language, which is great, interpretable language, you realize that Wikipedia talks about wakeboarding, it talks about kite surfing, ski boarding, other board sports. They are great. And it gives a description of each one. And finally, you can use a language model or any other model to choose and maybe compose the information and finally give the right answer, surfboard. All right, so ideally, this would be a great pipeline. And, and this paper goes into a bit more details on augmenting the transformers to language models by retrieving from Wikipedia. Knowledge graphs another way. Uh, Wikipedia is a text-only source of knowledge. Uh, we, and these, this is a multimodal extensions, right? Sometimes text alone is not enough. You want the text entities to also be matched with um, what these things could look like. So over here, there's several famous examples of these large-scale multimodal knowledge bases. In this case, it has a building that's next to a cornfield. It's outdoors, there's a basilia which is used for religious services. There's a museum, there's natural lighting. So you basically have all of these nodes, which can be either in natural language or it can be in the visual format. And there's some edges that tell you what relationships they are, right? Is it a descriptive relationship? Is it a functional? For example, Basilia is used for religious services and so on. And that's great because then you can use these knowledge graphs, again, using some form of retrieval that given a visual query over here, you can then uh, infer and retrieve from this knowledge graph what it might be used for, right? So these auditoriums are typically used for, for class, might be used for religious practices, attending performing arts, and so on. And finally, you can use that to give an answer. So of course, most of the challenges in external knowledge graphs are two things, right? One is just building the data. How do you take all the unstructured data on the internet put them in a form that is traversable, retrievable by deep learning models, by machine learning models. And there's some classic examples of lots of these knowledge graphs. Uh, we saw some examples of Wikipedia. That's usually for factual knowledge. Um, this multimodal knowledge graph, typically for outdoor scenes where the image makes a lot of sense. Visual genome is another example that's typically for outdoor scenes. This is uh, if then, common sense. Uh, if something happens, then something else should happen. Lots of knowledge of if then statements. Uh, common sense for moral, 
right? What is morally good? What is morally bad? What is morally ambiguous? Uh, into different categories related to relationships, people, actions, life and society. For example, it is rude to judge people based on their appearance. Um, it's understandable not wanting to share your feelings in public. All of these are examples of moral common sense. And also social common sense, right, over here. Um, if you want to call the cops on your neighbor, is that socially acceptable? When and when is that not socially acceptable? So a lot of knowledge graphs about moral and social. Yeah, there's a whole field of retrieval augmented language models, right? Retrieval augmented basically means that you don't just take in an input and generate autoregressively the output, but there's some mechanism for you to retrieve factual information uh, from some knowledge graph or knowledge base and return the factual information either by yourself or maybe, maybe within the context of other things that you generate. So retrieval augmented is a popular way. Um, entire courses, you know, lines of research on retrieval augmented. Yeah, so you can check that out if you're more interested. I'll probably put up the link. Maybe I'll add a paper for reading next week on retrieval augmented. All right. So just a quick summarize. We saw reasoning, local representations, aligned representations. Reasoning is how we combine all the information. And we saw four big paradigms, right? Uh, reasoning involves defining the structure. How should I compose? Is it temporally through time? Is it hierarchically? Is it through a graph? Is it interactively through reinforcement learning? Or how can we discover the structure? Intermediate concepts, deep features, hard attention, soft attention, language as a medium, which is ultimate interpretable, but still has problems with end-to-end -end training. Inference paradigm can be just through representations, but also through logical and causal, and finding examples of external knowledge. And of course, many questions, right? Um, structure, multi-step inference in a principled, robust way for all your big language multimodal models nowadays. How do you get a best mixture of interpretable concepts, but also differentiable? Language is great. Language, text, like your Socratic models that we saw are perfectly interpretable. But then these are just fixed, predefined models. You can then you can't really update them afterwards. Uh, composition. Uh, how do you go beyond logical and causal? What other ways of possible errors can be found? Uh, we saw examples of logical errors. And right? nowadays, people also find that even the order of things that you put into language models can make errors. So, what are other ways of composing so that you can mitigate these errors? Integrating explicit knowledge with pre-trained models, and finally. Even without building new methods for reasoning, can you just probe pre-trained models for the reasoning capabilities? Always a big question whether these pre-trained models are, are memorizing or are they actually doing some amount of systematic reasoning. All right, that's all for reasoning. We're gonna go for a fall break next week and then when we come back, we'll talk about generation. Thanks everyone. Yes. Uh, sure. But I, I would probably refer to the...